If you want to. Okay. That's all right. Nobody can. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Oh, you know what? I think you maybe turned that one. Did you just turn that one off? Oh, I have the mic. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing today? Oh, that's just wonderful. Today we're doing our education planning seminar. We're doing a second one. Um, the first one we had, we didn't have a chance to be able to video stream it, so John was kind enough to come in and do another class for us today. So with further ado, I'm gonna let introduce you to John. Let's give a big round of applause. Thanks, Lisa. Well, hello, thanks for having me today. Um, just to give everybody an idea, we're doing a, a quick home buyers education. Uh, give you a little background about myself. Um, I've been with Equitable Mortgage here for 17 years. It's actually the only mortgage company that I've worked at. So I've been there my whole career. But um, what we want to try to do today is just kind of go over basics. Um, I'm not a high tech guy, so there's just a couple little slides on here. But what I'd like to do, if possible, is when we kind of go through some of this stuff, there's going to be, well, hopefully a lot of questions if you have, you know, kind of specific things. Anything about the stuff we're talking about, uh, it's going to be just kind of an overview. We're going to hit on all the topics talk about them a little bit in detail on each one, and then if you have stuff we want to talk about or go over some questions, we can do it. There's a lot of different things uh, as far as home buying goes and what we want to do. Um, do we have people here that are going to be buying their first home or people that are already homeowners? So kind of we're going to be across the board. So if there's something that you want to talk about, just interrupt or raise your hand, kind of whatever you do. I don't want to be very formal with everything, so let me know kind of what you want to do from there. Uh, a little bit about me, obviously, like I said, I've been at Equitable for quite a while, so we'll kind of go over it. I'm going to just start with a little bit of an overview. I think one of the best things to do when looking at a house, whether it's your first one, you know, your 10th, you're buying a second home, or you want to get into buying investment properties or rentals, is to kind of just go through, get rid of that, um, a quick synopsis of how we're going to do some of this stuff. We're going to do a pre-approval, uh, then you're going to do a home search, you're going to do your application. We're going to get through the underwriting process, and then we're going to close your loan. Almost anymore, with all the different legislative changes and things that have gone through the last few years, the second things in here, that home search and the application, sometimes I would almost even flip-flop those at this point. Go through and just, uh, you can actually make that application, get everything done. You know 100% you're ready to go, and then you go ahead and find your search, or, you know, find the house you want to look for. Um, to kind of get started on things. So for our pre-approval, we'll kind of just start with that. Pretty basic things. The, the number one thing anymore for the home buying stuff is gonna be your credit. Credit's the most important thing. Anybody have a guess or an idea of what a, a good credit score is today? 480, 480. I'll say 480, no, but 840, yes. So we'd be good with that. Uh, anything in the you know 700 range we want to be at. Um, and then we're going to also talk about a quick debt ratio analysis. As the bank and as the underwriters go, we're going to take all of your outstanding debts or the monthly payments that you make, divide that by your gross income or your monthly income you make. That's going to equal your debt ratio. So you've got to fit within a certain box. Everything is, um, think of it as grids and boxes. You've got to fit into each separate category or each piece needs to fit to make that thing work. Uh, we're going to talk about asset verification. Asset verification is just basically if you're, you're buying a house and you're going to be doing a conventional loan and you're putting 5% down, we as the bank for the guidelines have to verify where those funds come from. Some funds are acceptable, some aren't. We document everything that kind of comes in and out of that account. So you want to be prepared for that so it's good to do that before you're that far down the line. Uh, we want to try to set some goals and some expectations for you on that. So, you know, if you're looking to maybe get a monthly 
housing expense of, let's say, $800 or $1,000 a month, we know if you're looking at a $400,000 house, it's probably not going to work out very good. So we need to know exactly where you're going to be. We want to have an idea of how much money you have down, if any, to put towards it. We need to know what monthly payments you're going to be comfortable with. And we, I usually go over that a lot with the clients, just to say, just because we can do something, let's say underwrite it or approve you for a certain program or rate and things like that, doesn't mean you necessarily want to do that one. A lot of people will go through and say, well, how much can I go up to? I usually like to say, well, what do you want to pay? And then we can kind of work towards that. So we don't always go all the way to the highest part on that. Um, it, kind of after you get all those things said, most people will use real estate agent, so they're going to use a realtor involved. Um, whether you do or don't anymore, there's a lot of people that still choose to, some don't. I'm kind of indifferent about it, kind of however you want to do it. Um, and then you're going to go find that house that you want to do. So we do have loan options. So there's a couple different pieces in here. I have a couple different handouts that are in there. And on one, we're going to just kind of leave, you know, backs up on that. So for the process piece, when you get qualified, uh, we're going to get all the piece of information from you guys. We ask a lot of questions anymore. So be prepared to answer a lot. Everything comes through. It's, it's um, we're going to get names and socials and date of birth and addresses and dependents names and all kind or ages and everything's going to get filled in the blank on that for the criteria we have to get. Once we kind of have the majority of that done, we're going to go ahead and talk about some loan options. Um, the loan pieces for what we do typically, I've got conventional loans, FHA, VA, bond money, USDA. Um, is everybody familiar with the majority of those? Conventional? Um, conventional loans, typically what we're going to do, they require 5% down on most loan programs. So just as an idea, you could think of those and say, you know, depending on how much money you have, let me go right to that one. So for conventional. 5% down payment on those as a minimum is what they're going to look at. With that down payment piece, it kind of comes some other criteria. You're going to talk about, you know, 5, 10, 15% down. You typically will have monthly mortgage insurance or PMI uh, if you have less than 20% down. And that monthly mortgage insurance protects the banks or the lenders behind the scenes in case of a default. So you think of it as the more money that you put down, typically the better terms you can get for that mortgage, be it an interest rate or mortgage insurance, it can kind of come down a little bit. Obviously the goal, everything being the best, we'd always want everyone to have 20% down, then you get the best rate that's available, and you're also then gonna get no PMI, the best terms that are available for that loan. Now mortgage insurance will eventually fall off, so if you get a loan and you put 5% down, after a certain amount of time, that mortgage insurance will drop on its own, or you can request to have it drop later after you have a certain percentage of equity in there. Any questions on the PMI or anything? What is a good time frame when it goes away after? After a little bit, yeah. If you go with, say, 5% down, a traditional amortization, the bank's going to look at it and just say, here's your purchase price, say 100000 you mortgage ninety five. And then they look at that amortization table. They'll print you on it. It'll just be based on kind of standard payments. Typically, I would say in that 8 to 11 year mark is when it drops off. The one thing that does not do is it doesn't account for appreciation on the house. So, you know, if you buy something today at a certain value and that is going up, hopefully you'll be able to drop it a little bit faster than that. Typically, that requires getting a new appraisal and sending it into the bank, and they'll go ahead and work with you on that. You always have to have good pay history on everything, so if you miss payments for some reason, uh, they may not drop it at that point until it hits it on their schedule, okay? Anything else? PMI is a percentage to how much, on a $100,000 loan. Yeah, that's a good question. PMI is actually determined or derived by a few different factors. One is the amount of money you have down. Another one is your credit score. And the last one is your debt ratio. So kind of each one plays a little factor, but almost think of it as like a staircase. 
And if you, the least amount down, the highest PMI, and as you go over, it kind of it works its way down every 5%. But typically, on a 5% down, if you're at $100,000, you'll be somewhere in that $80 to $90 a month range, I would think, for mortgage insurance for a conventional loan. And then if you put 10% down, that would probably be you know, about half of that. And it drops down to 15% down is kind of the lowest level at that point. Uh, so the next piece, and we're going to kind of talk about it for a little bit, though, is the credit. Credit is the most important factor right now as far as getting a loan. And a credit score is just your number that lenders use to decide if this person's going to make their payments back on time. Credit scores themselves aren't the only factor in getting that loan approved, um, but it's a big piece of it anymore. If you don't have a minimum credit score, basically it just isn't going to work. Um, it's got to fit in that box. So, for example, a conventional loan, they have minimum scores of, say, 620, uh, but the interest rate is adjusted based upon scores. So the lower the score, the higher the interest rate. FHA is a little bit more lenient on scores, and so are VA loans. Does anybody in here have a VA loan or would be looking for a VA loan particularly? Okay. So, I don't know if you guys have already gone through it. Obviously, much easier as far as credit restrictions go. Um, they'll go down a little bit lower, I think down into 580. So they're a little bit, a little bit easier to work with on that. And typically, the interest rates are going to be similar across the board regardless of credit score for that. A little bit easier. So with that credit piece, just to stick with that a little bit longer, credit bureaus keep your history for seven years. So what a lot of people have to remember is a seven-year history they're going to look at that full 84 months, top to bottom. So if you have issues, or let's say there's late payments or things on there, or maybe you don't even know what's on there, you want to try to get a copy of that report and look at it, it's challenging if you go and start looking at homes, find something, then you get in touch with a lender like myself or any, any other bank for that matter. They pull your credit and your scores, let's say it's you know 510 for whatever reason, and there's things on there that were from a few years ago. You could correct it, go back to the credit bureau and have it rescored, but that seven year history, they're gonna still look at that whole piece. So if you have, let's say, five years of not a very good pay history and the last two has been better, your score might be okay, but they still factor in those old things. So if there's anything that's out there, you always wanna kinda of get caught up, get them taken care of, and move forward so that you can keep that piece going. Um, so for seven years, credit scores typically don't move super fast either on the way up. You might have a great credit history. You've missed one credit card payment or one other piece, and you might see your score drop by you know, 50, 60, even up to 100 points on something. So it can move pretty quick. Conversely, getting it back up takes time because once something is on there, has to work its way down the line so it gets less and less weight attached to it. The uh, credit history itself is based on five factors. Your payment history, uh, the amount of debt that you have, the length of your credit history, like how long you've had accounts, and what kind of credit mix that you have. And we'll talk about that real quick here. We'll go into it. And so pay history, pretty self-explanatory. Um, if you make late payments or miss things, it's going to be a negative on you. Obviously, it's going to affect you quite a bit. Some other things that affect it would be, you know, if you have collections or judgments, liens, foreclosures, bankruptcies, all of those things are a factor. Obviously, certain things affect it more than others. So if you have a foreclosure or a collection account placed on your credit report, that's going to bring your score down more than, say, for example, just doing, say, a 30-day credit score late. Is it, people in here, have you, do you guys check your credit often? Or does anyone have like a service or anything they do? Ever notice any kind of issues on it or any problems? Well, if you have them, you have to go to the credit bureau, kind of work on those and get them set up. Um, credit bureau is pretty easy. Usually myself or anyone else who does what we're doing as far as lending or things like that, a bank can kind of help steer you in that right direction. In the back of this, you'll find that there's some information on the credit. I have um, the names and numbers and place like that, you can call the credit bureaus. Um, but pay history, to go back to that, accounts for 35% of your whole credit score. 
So if we're not doing very good with that, obviously you're losing out on 35% of all the available score that you're gonna get out of that. Uh, the next piece of your credit score is derived by your, the amount of debt that you have. So they're looking to see how much debt that you carry. So obviously, lesser the better as far as the, credit, as far as the scores go. Um, one of the things to look at would be a lot of revolving accounts or a lot of credit card debt. If you have a lot of credit card debt and it's maxed out, that's where they're gonna affect your credit score. So for example, I'll give an example of say, if you have a credit card with a $5,000 limit, even if it's paid on time, if you have $5,000 charged on it, it's probably affecting your credit scores a little bit. It's a little bit lower than maybe if that balance was down sometimes. So there are times we try to, if the scores aren't where you need them to be, redistribute that credit even though it's the same dollar amount, kind of move it around a little bit. Does anybody here get like credit card offers and pre-approvals all the time for new things? And does anybody ever take advantage of the zero interest type things? You guys transfer credit cards from one to the other? I say some people do that a lot. I want to be careful with doing that too often because length of credit history, the third thing that makes up that credit score is how long you have accounts. So that accounts for another 15% of the score. So that 15%, if you kind of jump around and open one card and then after six months when the intro rate goes away, you open a new one and maybe close it, you don't develop a real long history on those particular accounts. So the shorter that history, the less weight the credit agencies are gonna give you for that score. So you wanna always make sure if you can, keep them as long as you can, or even if you aren't gonna use an account anymore, maybe potentially just let it sit there if it's not costing anything. You don't have to always close it out because you'll still get a little bit of a rating off of that. A uh, Couple of the last pieces for the credit score is just gonna be your, your mix of credit and new credit. A mix of credit is just where the agencies will look and say, do you have all credit cards? Or maybe do you have a credit card and do you have a student loan? Or do you have an installment debt? which would be like a car loan, something like that. You'd have a car payment. Um, when you have a healthy mix of all those is when the scores are gonna be a little bit better. And for underwriting purposes, we're quite a pain anymore. We, will, we make everybody jump through a lot of hoops to get stuff through. So we ask for all kinds of documentation. So the easier the credit score is, the easier it's gonna be for you on that. Does anybody have any questions maybe on credit or how any of those other things, what, what affects you, maybe what doesn't affect you? How about if you have a mortgage right now, if anyone has a, anything, you know, maybe you're due on the 1st, overdue on the 15th, if you were to make your payment on, say, the 20th of that month, would you think that's gonna affect you on our credit score or no? Actually doesn't on most of those things. You have to be 30 days late typically for most accounts, so if you happen to miss something or you get that in the mail and say, oh man, this bill, credit card was due on the 10th and I didn't pay it until the 15th, you should be in good shape. You probably pay a late fee and they probably charge you for it, but as far as the credit bureaus go, to, as far as the scores that we require, it should be fine as far as that goes. It's not gonna hurt you too much. All right, so going back, we all know now, because I talked about it for 20 minutes, credit, the most important piece, factor, yes. Pay ahead on, you mean like as far as, the, like the. It, I don't think it will make it much of effect at that point because the whoever you're paying just sees that payment that's due on this date, they record it as it's paid on time. So the, I don't, I'm not sure it would make much difference at that point. It's good though, it makes a difference that it's being paid. So that's the most important piece, that it's there and in place before anything else happens to it. Anything else real quick or I'll move, keep going. But I do like a lot of questions, so the more the better. Anybody has any? All right, so for loan options, we talked a little bit about uh, conventional loans here. Down payment, 5% down is typically the minimum. Under the loan options, there's different things that you can get. You can have fixed rates, arms, balloon payments, things like that. Traditionally, probably 75% of the business that's written, not just us, but everybody, is a fixed rate loan. Uh, typically, you can get those fixed rates anywhere from 10 years all the way up to 30 years. Normally then at that point, obviously, the longer the debt, say a 30-year mortgage, you're going to get a lower monthly payment for that because it's spread out over a longer period of time. 
but because it is spread out over a longer period of time, you obviously are going to pay more interest on it as well. So the interest stretches out a little bit longer. So, you know, if you could get a shorter term, normally we like to look at that. So for guidelines, typically conventional loans are pretty run of the mill. They look for a couple year work history. They look at your credit score. We're going to go into the debt ratio here in a little bit. You work out a debt ratio. Um, and that's going to be pretty cut and dry. We actually have some programs in most places now will allow for gift funds. So for example, if you're going to try to buy a property, if you don't have your own money, for example, you can get gift funds from a family member, mom, dad, et cetera, that kind of thing. And that can help with the down payment piece. So some government loans, a couple other types of, of, of products are going to be uh, FHA, VA, USDA. Um, there aren't very many programs anymore that are true no money down or zero down loans. So I get that request a lot. Uh, the only two options we really have for the no money down products are going to be VA and USDA. So you already know that there's some people that either have VA loans or are eligible for them. That's an excellent product if you qualify for it. They allow zero down. There's no monthly mortgage insurance, even though there's you know, no down payment in it. So you get kind of the best of both worlds on that program with that. Uh, guidelines sometimes are a little bit quirky when dealing with um, some of the VA underwriter kind of things. They ask for some unique stuff, but pretty cut and dry. We say credit scores are very easy. We're leaning on those to go through on VA. On USDA loans, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it's basically rural development. But they don't want farm stuff, so they're basically lending on those that aren't in, you know, say Columbus, Dublin, Westerville, something like that, have to be a little bit further out. The property has to sit in an eligible area, which is something that anyone can help you find. You kind of there's a website you go to, you can look it up and see if it's eligible. There's other guidelines as far as what qualifications you would need income-wise uh, and down payment. USDA is a zero down, but they do charge a little bit of monthly mortgage insurance now. They never had, but it's relatively a recent change on that, so you would pay a little bit for that. FHA, probably the second most used product as far as home financing goes. It's a 3.5% down, so a little bit less down than the conventional loans. It's also a little less restrictive on credit score. So for FHA purposes, very easy to go through, underwrite it, and have a little bit more mortgage insurance. One of the things I like to, if you can avoid on FHA versus conventional, we talked a little bit about PMI and the mortgage insurance and when it goes away. FHA loans now, the monthly mortgage insurance, if you do the minimum 3.5% down up to 10% down, that monthly mortgage insurance is there for the life of the loan. So it actually stays that full 30 years if you take a 30 year fixed. So we'll have a lot of people that maybe will do that product up front. And if they're doing it for credit score purposes or down payment purposes, once they have the equity position, they maybe look to move that into a different loan so they don't have to continue to pay that mortgage insurance. If you put 10% down, then typically that mortgage insurance will drop off after 11 years. But with FHA, if you have a buyer with 10% down, typically we're not going to move you towards that product. But then we're going to go with the conventional because I think it's a little bit easier. So I think in there we're going to take a quick step out of that. You, you guys had all these other pages that were in there under loan process and stuff. It was I think everything's kind of separate in there. What I wanted to go through real quick now would be the debt ratio. and talk about that just for a couple minutes before going that. Unless people have questions about conventional or FHA or how they work or any specifics on, on any of those, I'm happy to go over that. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That's good. On, on a VA loan, what, what we're talking about is VA typically charges their, their guarantee fee or their upfront charge 
to the borrower, to the veteran. On the first time use, I believe it's 2.15% is the fee that they charge. And typically on any subsequent use, that fee for VA goes up. So they don't have the monthly PMI, but they charge their service fee essentially for it. And if there is any sort of disability, the 10%, you can waive that, or we w VA waives that fee so you don't have to pay it on any future time. So if that's there, obviously it's, it's very good to do that. I think typically we'll normally get the information on that from like the DD-214 or we get the certificate of eligibility from VA and usually it'll give us that information and tell me right away, hey, this is there. If it doesn't though, it's always better to tell whoever you're working with as much as possible so they can know to make sure they take it off of there up front. Yeah. Um, the question about the first time use, uh -huh. is it possible that Ohio offers accommodation for rentals for first time home buyers? There are a few for that. Um, Ohio Housing, so it's Ohio Housing Loans, it's a uh, bond money loan. What uh, the state does with that is they will allow you or help basically they grant two and a half percent of your down payment requirement to you for the new purchase. So we talked about that FHA loan that's still sitting there. It's a three and a half percent down payment, still required under the Ohio Housing or Bond Money Loan Program, but OFA will then give the borrower that two and a half percent. So then you would basically need that one percent down payment at that point. So they, they allow you to get in there. There are certain restrictions on what they'll do, you can't have it owned in the last three years. Uh, as far as other real estate goes, there's gonna be some income and loan limits on that that you have to qualify for. So you kind of think of it as, as layering, like you're gonna have the bond money up here and FHA underneath it. You can use conventional financing underneath the Ohio Housing or the bond money loan as well. Most people use FHA. The reason we see the majority of those Ohio Housing loans is for the down payment piece, you know, because it's hard to come up with down payment a lot of times. So if they give you two and a half percent of that, it makes it much easier than say coming up with a 5% for conventional, et cetera. Um, a couple extra steps in the process on that, you do a little, little bit of a loan application for the Ohio housing. Um, you'll need to find a lender who is eligible to do that. They have to go through their own coursework. You can go to uh, Ohio housing, I think it's ofa.org and they give you a list of that. Like we're technically approved to do those, but I do some OFA loans, but there's you know a whole list of people that you can find to do it. There's a lot of banks or credit unions maybe that'd be able to do those as well. Um, typically they ask that you stay in the home at that point if you're doing that, the Ohio housing for five years, they kind of have a, a timeline on it. There's nothing wrong if you sell it or move it, but there's certain things they'll look at on there. That I mean, that get most of your question or do you have anything else for that? No, no, there's, there's no restriction on it. There are some places that are called target markets and they have expanded criteria. Like you can buy a higher dollar amount or they'll let you have more income to qualify for it. So um, those target areas, it's kind of a little bit easier to get into most of those, but you can buy any property. It still has to meet certain guidelines. So it's gotta be you know, a property that's in good condition. They're still gonna appraise it and say, yes, it's livable. Yes, it's, you know, it's complete. There's no issues with it. So they're gonna do their traditional underwrite and review of that. So if you went to do that loan, typically what would you would do is, as a bank, we would do the actual loan application. We would underwrite it, appraise it, and approve you for the loan. Then once we approve it, we would give that documentation over to Ohio Housing and then they would review it to make sure all the criteria that they need are met, and then we would close the loan at that point after it was done. Um, but usually there's no, no issues on the house itself to do that, okay? Uh, yes, we, we, we do those. Mm -hmm. There's quite a few that, that do that you could find uh, on, their, on their website, or if you just talk to anybody, like if you're working with your own bank, whoever it might be, just ask them, are you guys eligible to do those? And they'll, they should know right away if they can or can't. They have to go through their you know, education and training and all the classes for that. Okay, anything else before I move on? Okay, so debt ratio, another thing that we're gonna, I don't know if I have a slide for debt ratio, so under, it's part of underwriting. The debt ratio analysis, it's so, 
in order for to know what we're going to be able to afford for the home, we're going to calculate your debt ratio. Um, debt ratios will vary from program to program. I've got a little bit of stuff in here. You guys know I'm not going word for word on it. I know you can read it all. But how do you calculate your ratio? This is one of the things a lot of people ask me about. So we've already kind of discussed the fact that the biggest thing for home buying is the credit piece. You want to make sure you're in place for that. We know, want to know how much you're comfortable putting down, what kind of payments you want, you know, where you want to be. Debt ratio is the next piece that comes into play. So what we would usually have people do is make a list of all the debts that they have. I have a sample um, worksheet in there for you guys. So if people want to work up their own later, you can definitely do it. Um, but we're going to calculate or take into account anything that is plugged into or shows up on your credit report. And so we already know, we've talked a little bit that on the credit report, you're gonna have any mortgages maybe that you might have. So if you already are a homeowner, that's gonna be there. Uh, car payments or leases will be in there. Credit cards are gonna be on there, student loans. That's the majority of them. There's a few things that can always pop on there. Sometimes we'll see sell bills or if people owe alimony or child support or whatever it might be, some of those debts come into play on there. Um, but we'd wanna go through and take account for all of your debts and then divide that by your income to see what your true debt ratio is. So does anybody here have a guess, would, will, as a lender or as an underwriter, are we gonna take you know, your take home pay? Like you're gonna, you have a thousand bucks that goes into your bank, or are we gonna take the gross pay? Gross, yep. So we're always gonna use the bigger number. So if your you know, gross pay is 1,200 or 1,000, whatever it is, that's the number we're gonna look at. And that's why that debt ratio really is there was they've got limits on it because they're accounting for the fact that well you're going to be paying taxes and all those other things are going to be coming out of that. So the debt ratios for a lot of these loans to give you an idea is going to be about 41%. My worksheets that I put in here I put 38. We always like to be conservative on our on our underwrite. We don't ever want to get you into a place where you know you're to that last penny that you can qualify for. So when you're working up your debt ratio normally what we'll do is you know make a list of all the debts, calculate them up on there, and that's gonna give you an idea of what your total payment would be. So for example, I did a, a base number here just as an example, and I can read it to you real quick. I put that um, we had gross monthly income of $5,000 combined. So whether obviously you're buying yourself or you're with somebody, there's gonna be two people on the mortgage. Obviously take everybody's debts and everybody's income at that point. So we're gonna say um, $5,000 in, in income, Monthly debts, I put a car loan, some credit cards, so about $500 in monthly debts or expenses in there. So if you take the gross income multiplied by that 38% debt ratio that's on this sheet, you end up with $1,900. Well, that $1,900 then is gonna be the maximum the debts that you guys can have total for qualifying purposes. So in that 1,900 then, we're gonna subtract out any debts that you have. So I had 500 in total debt. So you would have that $1,900, subtract out the 500, and it leaves the 14. That's basically the maximum monthly payment that we'd be able to qualify somebody for on that new house payment. So those numbers really aren't always set in stone. Usually on a conventional loan, we can go up to 45. On FHA, I don't even know if there is a limit to be honest with you, you can go much higher than that. I've had loans in the 50s get approved. But, you know, if we're, you're approving for something that high, obviously, we wanna make sure you're gonna be able to afford the payment. It's always about being comfortable with what you're gonna pay on that monthly basis and understand, you know, property taxes have a tendency to go up. They don't usually go down. Homeowners insurance a couple of years from now is probably gonna be a little bit more. If you buy that house and you haven't owned before, are you gonna need a lawnmower? Do you buy washer and dryer? Do you need whatever it might be? There's a lot of other things you wanna keep into, in your mind so that when you're working this ratio out, you'll be comfortable with that you know, new payment. With income on that debt ratio, there's different types of income. Obviously, people are W-2'd, they're hourly, they're commission, they're self-employed. Um, I'm not sure how everybody's paid, but you know, W-2 income, salary income, it's pretty easy. You get paid 36,000 a year, whatever it is. That's our number. Hourly, we're gonna take an average of the last couple years. So sometimes people's hours go up and down. The, how we kind of resolve it is just average over that large 
long period of time and that's what they're going to give you credit for. Sometimes people will have bonus income. They might work overtime. Still all going to be averaged together on that. Do you have anybody in here that either is self-employed or has someone, knows someone who's self-employed if they run their own business? A lot different for self-employment. They take those tax returns. We usually sometimes we'll have to get business returns, things like that. And then we're going to kind of go through and, and document all of it. So for the debt ratios, any other questions or concerns on that? Anybody want to need anything? Okay. So documentation, next thing we're going to talk about. We do, we do everything that you can think of we're going to document. So we're going to ask you, typically for the last two years of tax returns, W-2s, paychecks, and then typically 30 days of any kind of bank statements, so checking, savings, retirement accounts, things like that. Anything that we get, documentation-wise, has to be the full statement. It's got to be the actual statement. A lot of people do internet banking, and they're going to print off a summary or a printout. Normally, that isn't going to work. You have to have the actual something has account numbers. If there's eight pages to a statement, every underwriter is going to want every page to go through. We'll cover all those pieces on that. You have to document everything that kind of goes in and out of your account. So I know I'm, I'm bad about this, like I do everything online, and I bump money back around between one account and another. Paycheck goes in one, and then I take that money and put it into this other account and pay the bills out of it online. You have to document all the transfers. So as you're getting up to being ready to buy, just kind of keep that in mind. Whatever's going in and out of the account, we have to document. So we're going to ask you for it. And then if we ask for you know the Chase bank account statement from March, and we get five out of eight pages, I'm going to be calling you right back and saying, hey, we need to get the other three. Even though we know that they're blank, there's no information on it, we have to get them in there. So underwriting process for that, we have to document everything to the T. We're going to also do, I forgot about an appraisal. Obviously, once we're going to, you're in contract, we order an appraisal. We don't have control over that. None of the banks do. It's a random order. If the home is in contract for 100000 it appraises at ninety five. there's a potential issue. The only thing we usually do is go back to the seller, or you as the buyer can bring the difference to the table if you wanted to. So I don't know, have, has anybody run into that scenario with appraisals or had them done? Any kind of issues ever with them? Say, not too common. Every once in a while, they come up a little bit. So we'll go through those pieces and get that appraisal in and go through. All right. So once we get through all the documenting and all the other pieces, like we said originally at the, at the beginning of this, we can go through this whole pre-approval and approval process prior to you finding a house, which is actually kind of how I recommend things anymore is going a little bit ahead of time, or just get that pre-approval done, you find your place, and then you're going to make that application fill everything out and turn it in. Once we have all these pieces done, once you really turn that application into any lender, your job's pretty much done. Everything's going to be ready at that point to move forward. Anything we need, we let you know. We'll kind of go from there. And after that, there's really not much else that you do as far as get ready to go to closing. And closing is not much that you handle as a buyer. It's just someone who kind of takes into account so as far as home buying goes. They handle all the transactions at the end. So they're going to have all the paperwork for you to sign. It's all going to be together. I, as the lender, will submit the funds in there for the loan. If you're doing any conventional or anything else and you guys have funds you need at closing, you're going to have your money there at that point. Everything will be signed. They do a review of all the terms of the loan. Hopefully, when you get there, everything's the same as you expect. Like for us, what we do is, you know, a couple of days prior to you getting to that level, we send you all of that stuff to review and document it and go over it with you. So that way, when you get there, all you have to worry about is signing, taking your ID and your check, and then you're done. So, and that's going to be the majority of what I had today. Is there any other questions on stuff? Usually I had a lot. Uh huh. Yes? Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure, exactly. What? What we would do for the pre-approval is just we're going to get the basics from you. We're going to get your name, your social, your date of birth, lots of stuff, uh, your current address, and then your income information. So kind of 
it, it encompasses everything we just talked about right there, your credit, debt ratio, and assets. And so you're gonna let me know, the, you know those certain things. We'll go ahead and do the credit check. I'll run everything. I tend to be question oriented. So when we talk the first time, I'm gonna ask you a bunch of things about what are you comfortable payment wise? Where do you wanna live? How much money do you have down? Have you thought about taxes and insurance? We're gonna go through all those pieces, plug it together, and then I'll issue that pre-approval you know, as long as everything looks good, up to whatever dollar amount, you know, you're comfortable with. That usually just takes maybe 20 or 30 minutes as far as timelines go. As long as you have that stuff, you can give it to any, you know, lender that you talk to. And then they'll issue you that letter, give it to you. I like to meet with people if you want. I'm more comfortable going over it face to face. But once you're done with that, you can feel comfortable, you know, moving forward. We'll give you at that point a worksheet that's gonna estimate, say, okay, I mean, you're gonna buy this house at 100,000, you're gonna do FHA financing, and it's three and a half percent down. Here's what your estimated payment would be, because we're gonna look at, you know, the house payment will be pretty easy. It's gonna be a certain interest rate for a certain loan amount. Then I'm gonna give you an estimate for property taxes. If you don't have a house picked out, you always wanna keep into account or take that into, into consideration. You know, if you're looking in whatever, Westerville or Hilliard or wherever it might be, what the tax base is. And we can estimate that for you and say, based on a $100,000 home, here's what your taxes are. Same thing for homeowners insurance, we're gonna estimate it. And then we're gonna give you that sheet to say, this is what it looks like. And at that point, hopefully, it looks good to you too, and you're comfortable with it. If the payment's too high, you can say, hey, you know, I'm not sure this is gonna be comfortable, even though maybe I can qualify for it. We don't want to go that route. And we'll simply lower it down and find out what's gonna be the happy medium for everybody. And then go through that. And the credit score is gonna come into play, it depends on which loan program, say FHA or conventional, but credit score determines where your interest rate goes typically. So the lower the credit score, the higher the interest rate. They go opposite, so whatever you can do to get that credit score as high as you can, that's gonna get you the best term possible for that loan. So basically your income and your debt to income. Debt to income. The credit? Yeah, I like to look at them almost all at the same time, if we can. Uh, the debt ratio, because you, you can give me that information up front and say, what, what do you think I can qualify for? Here's what I make and here's my debts. I can do the math at that point and say, here's what you'd qualify for. But that credit score is that, la you know, is that piece that would plug in and say, well, you'd qualify for it at this rate or this particular rate you have to account for each piece. Unfortunately, the way it is, lending is set now, all those pieces are almost required to be able to give you an exact quote. But you could qualify for, say, like $100,000. Mm -hmm. And then you look at your interest, I mean, your credit score, and you've got an exceptional credit score, it would qualify higher or lower? Well, it might be a little bit higher or lower. It might be a little bit more. The score really is just gonna determine what, the reason that like, I talked about being a little conservative on my debt ratio when we approve you for it, when we look at it, we wanna have some room in that to know where you're gonna be. Because that credit score will affect that interest rate a little bit. So if you go to that last dollar, let's say you called me up and I, I run everything and you say, here's my income and debt, and I would say, you know, Mrs. Barr, here's what you can qualify for, 100,000 at this. In my head though, I'm assuming what your credit score is. If I Assume it's 700, it ends up being 600. If that rate goes up a lot, that'll bring down maybe what you qualify for at that point. Because the rate would be higher and your monthly payment would be higher. And so it could be opposite too. Like I said, if you have a really high score, maybe you get a little bit better interest rate. Maybe you can qualify for a little bit more at that point. Because the, the interest rate's lower, so you pay less for that monthly payment. Does that make sense? That could, a little bit? Okay. No, go ahead. <laughs> How would you handle, say, like, first you get ready to retire? <laughs> Nobody we know, right? <laughs> okay. And they're making a lot of money. And then they retire, and it's like an 8%. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend that they get a pre approval now or? I would, yes. After that's a, that's a hard question. I would say to do it now, but I always tell people to do it now. Whoever, whatever scenario is, the sooner you do it, the better you know where everything is. 
but we would talk about that in more detail because we would say, you know, if this is for a home purchase, are you going to be buying prior to retirement or after retirement? Because we're qualifying you and looking at these numbers based on where everything is today right now. Once you get into that contract and you're getting ready to close, everything's based on that timeline. So if we pre-qualify you now at a higher income before retirement, but you don't buy till later, we're going to use the lower at that point because you would be, let's say you would be retired at that point. So we'd use whatever the lesser amount is. So it really depends on when, you, when your plan is to actually buy something. Well, no, it depends on when you're going to buy the house. We'll, we'll do the pre-approval based on everything as it is today. But that pre-approval is only good as long as you're still safe at the current job. Everything's going to be based on those numbers. So if you go into contract to buy something, and you're, let's say you retire in June and you're going to buy in July, everything needs to be within 30 days of all the documentation we get. So we'll know at that point, okay, this person's going to have this other income. So if it's coming up, you may want to look at it first or get in touch with somebody, myself or anybody else, you know, whatever bank, talk to them about the situation and set it up. Hopefully that difference in income won't make a, a difference in the approval. You know what I mean? Because we don't want you to be, we said always, you know, to, to that last penny of getting you qualified anyway. So hopefully we would, you'd be okay with that. Okay. I think some, a couple more. Or either. Correct. You know, so that's the big crunch, and I, I guess I'd recommend anybody don't go out and buy a car, don't do a lot of things before you actually close, because you could get go to the closing screen and be well known, and somebody with credit in Cambridge the next couple of months or mm -hmm. two weeks, whatever, and you think you're going to get your car, but you don't. Yeah, it can be. It could be a, a very challenging thing. With, with the applications that we send out, and um, I know a lot of other places do the same, I have one big sheet of paper at the back that says urgent on it, and it lists all those things. It says don't do anything with your credit, don't you know, apply for new debt unless telling me, don't make any huge purchases without us knowing. Because as we go through that pre-approval, like you said, and we get to that final part, we have to, we're required now to do updates on the credit report and all those other pieces within like five days of closing. So if it updates it and all of a sudden you got another $600 car payment out there, it could be a big issue as far as the lender's concerned. So once you kind of get started on it, it just let the person you know what you, you're working with know what's going on. As long as they know, usually you can avoid any issues. If you don't tell them and something pops up, it'd be a problem. Are you referring to the VA approved process for loan purposes or whatever? For loan purposes? The, the, right, there, there's a couple different processes for that. As far as underwriting goes, we would still do an underwrite uh, for VA. Um, we have something called a delegation. Some, some people will do their own, some they send a VA to underwrite. Uh, the underwriting process is similar. A lot of times on the appraisal, if you're talking about the property specifically. Oh, for that, you, you know, really most should. If it isn't qualifying, there might be an actual issue with the property itself, like whether it's condition, you know, the structure or things like that. And if it's a problem for one loan, say VA, it's probably an issue for other options as well. Typically, if it's not meeting it, it's just because of the condition. Like there might be a, there might be. A, the appraiser would determine that typically. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, the appraiser is going to note all the requirements that are needed. Sometimes it might be as easy as, uh, for say, FHA and VA, a little more restrictive on the appraisal. They might want something repaired on it. Like you have to have hand railings on staircases, anything more than three steps or something like that. It might not have it. So they would come back and say, yeah, this is okay, but we want this thing fixed to meet VA guides or it needs to be fixed to meet FHA guides. So that's going to be part of the appraisal process.
Okay, that's a good question. A home inspection, we're going to look at that different. There's going to be two of those. There's a home appraisal. The appraisal is going to be something that the lender does. And it's, an, it's, got, it's a blind order, so we never know who gets it. It goes through. A home inspection, most lenders don't require on things. We usually say, I, I would probably do one if I was buying a house. But we could get a list for you of those. I don't typically order those for someone, but we get you a list of three or four. Depends on the house size. I would expect to pay anywhere between $200 and $300 for those. Those are much more detailed as far as the interior of the house than the appraisal that the bank. The bank orders it and just says is the value based on the houses next to it seem fair. No, you don't need an engineer. Just a, home, a licensed home inspector would be able to do it. If there's an issue with the house, like to kind of tie back over here, we've had issues where someone, a home inspection gets done and there's a problem with the basement wall. It's bowed in or cracked. At that point, typically, you would need a structural engineer to go look at it and say, is this an issue or not? So it kind of moves it up. Sources for down payment are going to be, you know, checking savings, retirement accounts. If you take money from a 401, anything that's your money is typically good to use, except for, let's say, credit card advances. It's hard to borrow money. So if you think if you're borrowing money from a place to put down, the bank's typically going to have an issue with that. But I've had people use their cars, collateral, things like that. Anything that you own is okay. Yeah, that's a hard question to answer. I get asked that a lot, though. It, I, I really can't give you a good answer on it. I think rates are going to stay stable. This is just a personal opinion that there's, anything can really swing these rates in one direction or another. A couple months or a couple economic reports that come out, you know, how's the economy doing, essentially, will change that. I think we'll be fairly stable for a while, though. At some point in the future, they will go up. We can't stay this low forever. John, we have uh, one more question, OK? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I would say maybe the majority of married couples have it together, but you definitely don't need to. I see across the board a lot. There's a lot of times we'll have only one or the other on because of a credit situation or because of an income situation or, or their debt. If you're on jointly, if both people are on the loan, they're going to take the lower middle score of both of you. So when we pull a credit report, we get three credit scores from all three agencies. Whichever one is the middle for both of you, they take the lower of the two middle. That's going to be the representative score for the whole process. So they'll take the lower of the middle score for both borrowers. So like for yourself or for your husband, whichever middle score is lower is the one that we would use. So that's something that as we talk about on the pre-approval, that's something that we would want to go over. And as we pull that, we're going to talk about that and say, well, can we do it with one versus the other or both? Or does it make a you know, significant difference either way? Pay cash for her. Is it just for part of it or all of it? For part of it. It really won't make much difference at that point because we're going to still look at the remaining loan that you need and just still qualify it off of the same credit score and income. I mean, they'll give you credit for the, for the down payment cash. Basically, it's going to be gift funds, so to speak, as far as the down payment. And that would maybe determine which loan program we'd go to. Do we go FHA conventional? We could do it either one at that point. There's kind of a lot of details to go in with that question. So you want to talk to somebody a little bit more detailed on that. Okay. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Let's give a big hand. Thank you. We could be out in the hallway if there's any additional questions. Uh, DFAS has a conference going on. Is that correct?
and uh, we need to get up and get out. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. If you have any COPEC um, evaluations, I'd love to have them. I need to show proof that, okay, all right. <laughs>